Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Today we are talking to musician and author John Zaremba. He is a musician, especially I believe in the electronic, uh, more avant-garde kind of uh, types of uh, musical creations. He is also an author of a... It took me a while to figure out what the hell this book was called, by the way. <laughs> Excelsia Book 001. We will we will go in detail why you picked that title and why it took me so long to figure out what the hell it meant. But first off, John, welcome to the show. Hey, Bastion. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a fan of your videos. I've been watching them, and uh, I just appreciate you having me on the, the chat with you a little bit. So thank well, you. Well, I appreciate you sending me the book, so that was pretty nice. So some background. We have a mutual friend in uh, fellow uh, author and musician and interview subject, Howie Bentley, who uh, got in touch with me and said, hey, John's got a book out. Uh, you want to take a look at it? And you're like, you got us in touch. And yeah, it took me a little bit of a while to get through this one, but which we'll get into. But yeah, I like uh, quite a bit of it. And I learned also that you had like a 20 year career in music as well and a whole bunch of other stuff. So this should be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you introduced me as a musician. And uh, to be a stickler, I'm a retired musician. So, well, has anyone doing... ever really re retired when there's a song in their heart? <laughs> I've been recycling my music. So, even though I don't <laughs> record music anymore, um, I've got other projects where I'm doing different things with the stuff that I've recorded in the past. Yeah. Well, for, among yeah. other things, here, if we look at uh, some of your discography, in fact, uh, there's some uh, definite correlations, including the title of the book, which I'm sure you can explain to me why the heck you picked something that took me actual research to figure out what this, how to pronounce this damn thing. <laughs> well, the, the honest reason is to be somewhat difficult. So uh, I don't, uh, I want to be, I want to set myself apart from other people that write speculative fiction. Mm -hmm. And I come from a background of electronic music, like you mentioned, and the artists that I listen to, their song titles are sometimes in hieroglyphics, like literally hieroglyphics. So there's a deliberate um, attempt to be askew with a lot of that stuff. Yeah, we're talking so about would, people like Aphex Twin and uh, stuff like that. Exactly. Aphex Twin, Square Pusher, Autecker, all those guys. Sometimes their song titles are just like a, a list of time code you know for example so that's part of it because i want to represent that's part of my background um but but more pragmatically it's just the catalog number so the book is kind of like just called john zaremba and it's mm -hmm. book one and hopefully it'll be a book two um and uh my former record label and everything i release is a catalog so like xlza is Exeliza. And if I was releasing a CD, it would be CD01 or whatever. This is book one. So it's XLZA BK01 is just Exeliza yep. book one. Yeah. Well, you know, I had to look at other part interviews where, where you explained that in order to figure that out. But that, that brought me to, the, to looking at your discography. And you have put out quite a few of self, uh, self uh, released uh, albums over the years. Yeah, yeah. I had a couple that came out on different independent labels, but the vast mm -hmm. majority was self-released. Um, I got into electronic music when I was still in high school. Um, we're talking uh, early 90s. And um, I just loved it. I, I like electronic music. I like all kinds of music. So as we talk more, you probably find a lot of that out. But electronic music always spoke to me because the sounds that were used were not things that I could replicate. Mm -hmm. So like if you hear an electric guitar, it's vibrating strings. Even if it's amplified, you can kind of connect to vibrating strings. But when you hear some of the sounds coming from synthesizers and stuff like that, there's really nothing in nature that sounds the same way. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I got into it like from that perspective, which is probably how a lot of people get into electronic music because it's much more, it's just as much sound based as it is like compositionally based. You know, the songs are often way more simple than a lot of the other music I like if you were to notate them. But the composition, uh, in, in terms of what you do with the sound, has uh, some complexity there. Especially since you're actually creating, in many cases, creating your own sounds. As opposed to, like, you know, taking a pre-existing instrument, you're creating, say, okay, I want to sound that something, something that sounds kind of like this, but not really at all. And I want it done using this kind of instrument, but not really this kind of instrument. I want something completely unrelated to anything else that you would find in nature <laughs> or in other music. Can I do that? Yes, I can. <laughs> so I guess That's there's a lot of bit of a, there's a great deal of that kind of creativity that goes into this kind of uh, genre. Yeah, yeah. Especially the kind of stuff that I gravitate towards, um, more experimental sounds. Uh, 
a lot of the music that I composed in the past was me just fiddling with the sound and then hearing how that sound evolves that kind of builds into either a rhythm or a melody or something like that and just basing a song around that particular sound I always, I always try to veer away from like presets you could buy a synthesizer and it will come with a thousand sounds on it yeah. i never wanted to use the presets i always wanted to build mine from scratch nice yeah like anybody in the 80s who would got themselves a uh, used casio or something like that had the like anybody who's ever just fiddled around with an old one of those old synthesizers has those little like you know press the cat button and goes bow, 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 <laughs> and tried to make something like that i mean oh god now i have the video of the cat playing the keyboard in my head oh god it won't go away please help me dear god okay suffice to say yeah there's you know there's that kind of creativity and there's also you know you see from there also the where you see where electronic music wins was from the eighties and such from that era of synthesizers. Now you have synth wave, you know, dark wave and all those different kinds of music, which I like quite a bit. I have some of my favorite bands like yeah, that particular genre, Perturbator, Carpenter Brute, uh, Dance of the Dead, which is like, hell, even John Carpenter has three albums out. And That's they're crazy. Damn good. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like his music better than I like his movies, to be quite honest with you. I like his classic movies are, are great. Mm -hmm. But if I were to put him on the scale, like, do I want to spend time with his music or his movies? I'm going to spend time with his music. Well, I mean, you get his music throughout his movies as well. So there's always that to look too. What's your favorite John Carpenter movie? My favorite John Carpenter movie? I mean, I'm probably going to have to go with The Thing. I mean, that seems to be the one that, you know, comes to mind immediately. But I do have a, you know, a bit of a fondness for Prince of Darkness as well. Mine is Assault on Precinct 13. Uh, I can see I why. That movie so much. The first time I saw it, I didn't even see it as like a gang movie. Like it's a zombie movie to me. Mm. Like these guys are trapped into a, it's a police station, but it's really like a house. Yeah. And the, the it's a siege. Yeah. Yeah. It very much reminded me of a zombie movie. So that's, mm. and I love the score to that one too. He's just, he did a really good job on that. Yeah. I can see that. It's also like, you know, reference to something like a Western where you have like, you know, a stagecoach being attacked uh, by bandits and everybody has to pull the wagons together to defend themselves. And there's possibly some friction between the different people in there. I mean, John Carpenter is obviously a massive, you know, Western nerd, as you can imagine. Like he literally made uh, James Woods do a John Wayne impression for vampires, <laughs> which is a great movie. I mean, honestly, that would be in my, you know, top, uh, I know a lot of people shit on that one, but I don't think it's one of my top uh, favorite uh, John Carpenter movies. It's just like so unashamedly a Western with yeah. blood sucking monsters. It's awesome. <laughs> it's hard to say he's done anything that's bad. You know, there's other classic directors that have just put out some stinkers. Mm. Even in Carpenter's less favorable movies are still better than a lot of the other things that came out at the same time. Oh, I have seen significantly worse movies than even his worst stuff. Mm hmm. I'm not sure what that says about either his stuff being super great, even when it's bad, or other people's bad, bad stuff being just terrible, but who knows, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, speaking of, like, the inspiration, I was going through your book here, and then looking through your discography, and I'm seeing some different, uh, you know, this book is almost like a concept album in reverse, as opposed to a story being written for, uh, and then, you know, translate to music. For an album here you have your music that is now in the form of this book here containing seven different stories ranging from my wife's back <laughs> ranging from <laughs> sword and sorcery with the uh, einhander you have promontory which is like you know zombie well zombie massacre book uh, story at that point yeah, Vade, which is a demonic possession horror vigilante romance modern action you've got a lot of good variety in here was the intention always to write them in a different of uh, different subjects, different genres, not be associated with a particular one? Yeah, and to be honest, myself, I'm not a fan of like strict genre genre guidelines. Like most of my favorite things are things that blend genre from one to the other. Mm. So, um, and it's probably to my own detriment, honestly. Like it's it's hard to get people interested in a book if you tell them it's got an old guy with a gun shooting gang members. And then it's got like some weird philosophical piece about birth and death. And then it's got uh, demonic possession and, uh, you know, sword and sword. Like it's, it's hard to sell that quite mm -hmm. honestly, but that's, that's just where I'm at. I'm, I'm always someone that likes to 
uh, explore different things. I'm a curious guy is what it comes down to. And I, I wanted to make a book just like I did with my music, that would hopefully appeal to people that are similarly curious. Hmm. Well, it explains the uh, title and the, the <laughs> cover there. It doesn't really tell you exactly what you're in for, but it gives you like, you know, got a hammer, a gun, a brain, a sword, and a weird demonic claw thing. So yeah, it gives you an idea of the variety, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and each of the weapons on the cover corresponds, as you probably saw, to the different characters in the story. So yes, it may not make sense when you look at it, but as you go through it and you get to the the title page of a new story and you see that icon, there you go. Yeah. That's Vade's claw. Yes. Yeah, which tells you an idea. Okay, because those certain of these stories, like this first one here, non-existent voices whisper subliminal passages of hopelessness. The new album from Balshar Goth. <laughs> <laughs> I love Balshar. Yeah, I know. Me too. And then you follow up with uh, Einhander here, which is the sword. And of course, since I can you know, understand German Einhander, I kind of had an idea where that story was going to end up. Uh, somebody's going to take a chop. I really should turn this thing off. <laughs> yeah, you uh, can look at that either way. Either it's because um, there's also a video game called Einhander. I'm not sure if you've played it or not. I uh, don't think I've played that one in particular. Notification settings do not disturb. <laughs> I really it's, should think uh, of doing the these things beforehand. Do. <laughs> <laughs> the game has nothing to do with the story at all. It's a, uh, a, a side-scrolling shmup, shoot 'em up game. Like yeah. uh, if you think of like R Type or something like that, Thunder Force. But it was called Einhander as well. And there's a lot of references to similar two-dimensional shooting games throughout. That's I'm not a big video game guy, especially now. I never play video games at all. But I mm. grew up on two-dimensional side-scrolling shooters. So yeah. there's a lot of reference to that. That's where including the, that's where on the, the cover right here. It looks like it, doesn't it? It's almost like a mothership, and you got the drones coming around. Yeah, specifically, I think uh, from Thunder Force Two, as I've uh, learned. Yep, that's what. Yeah, I that's did my research. <laughs> <laughs> You're prepared. And yeah, I do my research on my interview subjects. But yeah, so and yeah, I did notice uh, quite a few. There's also like you know. In terms of just the t the pacing of the stories, it does feel a lot, I guess I would say musical in that sense, in the sense that it doesn't necessarily have the same feel as something that was originally written for the page, as opposed to having been transposed from a musical uh, setting more to another uh, lit more literary uh, format. Why am I having such a with that? So how oh, difficult... Yeah. Well, how difficult is it to take something that you've already created for not only, you know, music, but also electronic music, experimental or avant-garde electronic music at that, and turning it into an actual, you know, literary story with a start, middle, finish, and uh, going on from there? It kind of depends on what, on the story itself. So Einhander, um, that album that I released called Einhander, there's uh, five tracks on the album. The first track is called Your, second track is Death is my life. my life yep and that's yeah. the mantra that he repeats throughout the story so that was kind of like the genesis of that is um and, and the backstory of that album is the, the the album that came out before that was called vigilante romance which is in the book as well but yeah i pushed vigilante romance so hard like i tried my damnedest to get a record label to pick that up and no one wanted it it's just no one wanted most of my music to be honest with you. but that one in particular uh it burned me pretty bad there you go yeah <laughs> So I, um, the album that came out after that was my uh, oh, middle finger. <laughs> it is, but but I, I really it was almost like a curse upon the the record labels that wouldn't sign me for Vigilante Romance. So like the liner notes of Iron Hunters, me just going on a rampage about how much they all suck, and I hope that they're <laughs> a pox upon their families and all this kind of stuff. So that's where the the song titles from that came from, and I just kind of built the story around that. Mm -hmm. At the same time. Uh, I, the, all the battle sequences in that story are things that I've rehearsed in my head for years and years and years. Um, yeah, you might not they are copious. <laughs> this thing is the it's the, practically novella length story, and it's just like one running battle from start to finish, practically. I mean, just yeah, it, like this whole out of this whole book, this is that one story, and <laughs> there is practically not a page that doesn't go by without somebody getting eviscerated. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. And it, but that's that's what that. That's the essence of what that story is about. It is about Einhunter, in this case, single-handedly uh, devastating those that have wronged him. And then after he's completed that mission and he's achieved the revenge he sought for, 
what does he do next? What does he turn his attention to next? Does he just retire? Or does he pursue something that is even a higher lofty goal that may or may not have directly caused him the dismay that led to the start of the whole battle? Yeah. And of course, he should that path. So it's a rant, it's a story about rampage. It's a story about um Bastion. I mean, I I'm honest with everybody. Like if I was the school shooter, <laughs> I would read Einhunter and I would learn to be like a school shooter for Einhunter. Like that's kind wow. of like yeah, it's kind of sick, but it's, it's well. Admittedly, like, the guy is definitely not a role model in terms of his personal philosophy. He's very much like, yeah, I'm just gonna kill anybody I feel like uh, killing, and there's really, you know, nobody who's gonna stop me. <laughs> I mean, the fact that he's also wielding a sword that pretty much makes him like, you know, a goddamn one man uh, army is <laughs> definitely a point in his favor in that regard. Yes, his sword is his father's sword, and um, it, the, it has the essentially the power of entropy. So it almost cuts as if it was like a lightsaber or something. Whatever it touches, it devours, and it, it consumes it into nothingness. Mm. So, so his sword is almost unmatched. That's kind of the, the drive for uh, those that are opposing him also. But there's a lot of symbolism in the story as well. So it's also a story. It's a rampage against uh, piety. It's a rampage against... Um, an overarching culture of subliminal oppression, which is what like the, the enemies represent in the story. So mm -hmm. um, it's something that bothers me about our current climate in the world right now. And that's kind of like, this is like a symbolic representation of that, of, of fighting against the holier than thou uh, atmosphere that we have right now. Yeah. Well, Definitely, it is very much uh, visible in there, because, I mean, holy crap, A. I mean, if you want something that was downright transgressive of, you know, a politically correct more, shall we say, this guy is definitely in there. I mean, do you find that difficult to, like, if I was going to go to describe the genre of this story, I wouldn't even go sword sorcery. I go full on to Grimdark or something like that, that particular genre, which is related in many ways, but definitely pours on in terms of like you're both the violence the or and also the like nihilism and the you know general tone it, that one would fit right into that genre like hook line and sinker and it's just like wow yeah going through that one that one i have to admit i had to stop reading that one at times because it was just getting too intense at, uh, for after a while plus you, know, you have a very yeah that and you have a very dense i think you have a very dense writing style especially for this one it was just mm -hmm. like you know Okay, I gotta take a break. It, it's a lot to consume, and uh, you know, I was going for a hard R with that, you know, uh, NC seventeen, I suppose. Oh yeah, but that's like I, I don't, uh, I don't want to write anything for children. I don't want to write anything that children should even read. Yeah. Um, you know, the next book that I come out with is going to be a, it's going to be the inverse of this. So that there'll be a lot more softness and gentleness in the next book, but this one, um, it, all these stories and stuff were conceived when i was like in my early 30s and i was just going hard and uh i was in much better shape and i was exercising a lot so i would imagine these battles as i'm running you know seven eight nine miles at a time or hiking up some mountain or something so like th those are the things that went through my head when i was doing vigorous activity mm. so they just became the, the battle sequences became imprinted and i just needed to get them out and i I would try to get them out with music as well, but um, it just doesn't translate as well with electronic music. Like if I was in a heavy metal band or something, I'd have a much easier time of getting that uh, aggression out music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely see that. Although I can, I've listened to my fair share of electronic music that takes a lot of inspiration from metal, like, you know, the aforementioned mm -hmm. Perturbator and stuff like that. You listen to something like from uh, like track uh, Neo Tokyo or something like that, and it feels like a firefight's about to break out at any moment. <laughs> Yeah, um, I know that band and a few of those other like synthwave bands. They really they capture that that essence and that atmosphere mm -hmm. quite well. Um, yeah. yeah, listening to those, it's it almost feels like you know listening to the soundtrack of an '80s uh, sci-fi action movie that never got made. I think that's you know one yeah. of the attractions. Those, well, you see a lot of that. Uh, you like your people make videos for these things. It's usually lots of anime and stuff like that, or you know '80s movies and stuff like uh, those kinds of things. I think that's a common reference point in that regard. And I think a lot of, you know, especially like for Vade and, you know, the next story in this one, Promontory, that's very much like, you know, 
I can see this one being made with a much bigger budget, like you know Lucio Fulci or something like that, uh, doing this kind of thing. And a nice take on the. Uh, I barely even want to call them zombies because I don't remember seeing the word anywhere in the story. But you know, the Walking Dead and uh, the results of smashing them into bits. Yeah, I I love zombie movies. It's a shame how like the Walking Dead just kind of ruined that appeal. I think for a lot of people possibly. Mm -hmm. But um, zombie movies throughout the 80s, man, those are like some of my favorite horror movies. And I wanted to do something different with it. And it's kind of like a combination of like the Fulci movies, any of the European uh, gore movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tomb of the like Blind the Dead or Demons or anything like that. Oh, man, those Blind Dead movies are great. Uh, my buddy uh, Matthew Knight and I have a project. We did like a Blind Dead concept album recently. Mm -hmm. So if anyone wants to check out Haunted Abbey Mythos, we have a Blind Dead a uh, little musical bit there. He also but did yeah, something with regards to Clark Ashton Smith with that same imprint. Yeah, see, man, you did your research. I did. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> the Beast of Averroine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's that project is called Haunted Abbey Mythos, and it's, um, I guess, the term that I've heard people use is sound novel now, like where you take a, a novel or a novella or something and you score it. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of approached it from like a if it was an old radio program or something that you might have heard yeah. back well, in the day. That is what they did for, you know, uh, radio dramas and stuff like that. You had a soundtrack and you had multiple actors doing voices and stuff like that. You know, classic ones like The Shadow that everybody knows about and a host of other ones. And I think there are certain audiobooks that are done nowadays or audio podcasts stuff like that, for, you know, story podcasts that do the same kind of thing. It's just, you know, a modern recreation of that genre. It's neat how that's kind of gaining some steam there's a record label i wish i could remember the name of it but that's what they specialize in mm -hmm. and they've taken classic stories like uh, i know they have a couple like thomas Ligotti stories and a few other horror writers yeah well, thomas Ligotti, he's heart. definitely is yes. thomas Ligotti is one of those authors that's you it really like you says okay this guy probably needs some help but i'm not sure he should get it because his stories are probably wouldn't be as good in the you know sheer like demented darkness of them like you know, i mean the same could be safe for hp lovecraft back in the day yeah, i'd never even heard of thomas Ligotti until like six months ago quite honestly i'm not a big reader as you may or may not know but thomas Ligotti, um he's uh one of the most honest because he he does have problems like he's I, he's mentioned it in interviews and everything he suffers from crippling anxiety and a whole host of other heavy know, misanthropy theory. Yes. Yeah. And, and he, and he doesn't hide it. Yeah. Um, and his stories, like his stories are very philosophical. Like I don't agree with his worldview, but there's no mistaking his worldview and his stories. Like, yeah. He, yeah. The, uh, his, uh, his book as a book, essay book, the conspiracy against the human race, which is basically like a, a justification for anti natalism was served as a lot of the philosophical, uh, basis for Rustin Cole in uh, the first season of true detective actually. Wow. I haven't read that yet. I, that's, something i need to check it's out it's a right? hard read it's you know frightfully convincing if you're in the right mindset and then that, that's the kind of thing where it's like you know yeah humanity should stop reproducing and just let itself go extinct because you know non-existence is better than anything else and it's like yeah i need to put this book down for a bit <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah it's if you want to get into it like if you're going to be playing some delta green or something it's a pretty good you know book to get into the right mindset but you know it's the kind of thing that she, it's not for light reading. Yeah. He has a, a very distinct nihilistic streak that um, is like predicated on his belief that the universe is entirely composed of chaos. And yes, there's chaos in the universe. Yes, there's tragedy, but that's the exception, not the norm. Mm. Even though like the stuff I write is very heavy handed and it's very violent and all of that, I'm truly a romantic at heart. Like there's even Einhander, not to tell the end of the story, but some people might read that story and think it's a tragedy of, or some sort. To me, it's a very happy ending. So um, that's where Ligotti and I differ is that I don't, I spend a lot of time in nature and there's just so much harmony in nature mm -hmm. that I don't see it as being this oppressive force that just uh, wants to sap the happiness out of life. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of his thing. So like when I would read his stuff, um, I would have to read it a couple of times, first of all, to even understand it because his writing style was really tough for me. Yeah. But um, I have to like just take a break from it, like you said. Like, okay, I'm gonna go outside and, and take a walk, take my dog for a walk, get some fresh air or something, and you know, sort of rekindle the hope. Yeah, <laughs> because he's a very hopeless uh, touch writer. grass, as they say. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's one of the things that, generally speaking, I have a greater preference for sword and sorcery than the grim dark genre, which is a bit more like you know fantasy in that vein, at least with that particular tone and you know style and outlook, I guess you could say. Mostly because you know, I like what they what's been said about sword and sorcery has has a bit of that northern courage kind of feel to it, where yeah. The world is going to drown in chaos. Ragnarok is coming. So what? Strap on a sword and go fight it. You're going to lose. But you know what? They're going to remember your goddamn name. You know, yep. that uh, that sense of, you know, yes, the battle is hopeless, but we're going to fight anyway because goddamn it's worth it. And, you know, it's the principle of the thing. It's the difference between Iron Maiden and Man of War. Rather than run to the hills, <laughs> we'll die fighting. So, like, that's... <laughs> That's the sword and sword, sword and sorcery is that you know I'll, I may die but I'll die with a sword in my hand. Yeah. A lot of the fighting, kids, you know, fighting, fighting the world. <laughs> I do like Man of War a lot. <laughs> That's right. I do like Iron Maiden as well, but Man of War I can listen to a, a little bit more than that, I think. Probably because there's such you know every album covers a goddamn sword and sorcery album. <laughs> okay, but to music, let's face it. Yeah, I think I mean uh, there's not too many like metal bands that embraced that as fully as soon as they did you know mm -hmm. by like the mid 80s late 80s it was pretty common but early 80s they were the ones i mean they were the ones that uh the whole dark avenger character from their yeah. debut album is yeah. is like you know it's like a um i don't know i mean it, it's 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 the iconic uh single warrior you know seeking revenge and killing the Oh, raping the daughters and wives. I mean, if we're crying out loud, that's in the lyrics of the song. So like yeah. that, they really, they were a hard R in the early 80s before anyone else caught on to that. They have a, a song called Pleasure Slave. Yes. <laughs> Although I think uh, my favorite song of theirs is probably Black When Fire and Steel, just because I can listen to that one over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, the opening, just like, they, their music is simple. I mean, they, I think a lot of people could just pick up a guitar and play the music. And just the opening, you know, you know, fast picking of Blackman Fire and Steel is so iconic. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing complicated about it, but it's just right. It's like yeah. doing the most with the least. But that final bit at the end when there's he's really just going, and, and I can't I can't do it. I cannot hit those high notes, but he hits that high note on the recording and it just keeps going for so long. Yeah. I don't even know if they can pull it off that way anymore. But at the time when that was recorded, holy crap, that is good. I mean, I'm and a metalhead, so <laughs> I can appreciate that, that a lot. And it was all done before all the studio trickery. I mean, they have no computers in any, or anything like that recording that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what you hear on the album is like legit real. There was no, uh, you know, pitch shifting or keying up or keying down or any of that stuff. No, Eric, I, I, he was the best vocalist, I would say, through the 90s, quite honestly, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have other bands that eventually, you know, took up that particular uh, torch, and you know, do think there are lots of bands nowadays that take inspiration from sword and sorcery. You know, our mutual friend Howie has, you know, Cauldron Born, which is like, you know, full on, not just you know Howie's own stories, but also you know Robert E. Howard and such. Uh, you got you know Balshagoth, which we mentioned earlier, which is the guy has created his own myth mythos, and the. Uh, Eternal Winter, uh, Matthew Knight, who you uh, were mentioned, you worked with uh, on the the uh, damn it, what was the name? Under the Mythos. Under the Mythos, yeah, and who's also you know written his own uh, sword and sorcery stuff as well. I mean, there's a big correlation between metal and sword and sorcery that, well, I think it's just it goes really goes tantamount to the connection between that kind of music and the kind of literature the themes that really resonate with each other when it comes to the uh, electronic music what would you say is the kind of literature literature that would resonate most with that something that's non-fiction mm -hmm. <laughs> quite honestly because people that do electronic music it's pro you program i mean you can maybe play a few things here and there but even the the, the most talented uh musicians with dexterity with their fingers to do good electronic music it's all coding so mm -hmm. I would say like an instruction manual, the phone book, something like that is the kind of literature that electronic music to prefer. Um, I don't know any electronic musicians that read fiction. And if they do, it might be like classic sci-fi. There's a there's a correlation between sci-fi mm -hmm. and electronic music a lot. Yeah, I would see that. Yeah, most of them, I don't, and the other thing is, there's just a, 
a, a mental acuteness with electronic music that people that are really good at that, which I was never as good as the people I'm, I'm referring to, but those people, they don't have the patience to read. They're not going to sit down. They can't calm their mind enough. Mm. When you're composing music that's like 250, 300 beats per minute with 30 second notes that just like to the objective listener may just sound like a snare roll for three minutes, but there's actually complexity in there. Like the people that can do that um, and remain sane, they're not going to read a book. <laughs> or if they do, they're going to, you know, they'll write, they'll read a book, but only one they have written containing just the notation of everything they put down in there down to the millisecond, just like constantly repeating every single page. Although at that point, I guess you couldn't call them saying anymore. So, you know, it kind of defeats the point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you mentioned like your video games. There's a lot of, you know, you look at certain, certain genres and they either had their basis in video game music or a lot of cross, uh, you know, cross pollination. The uh, house music genre had a lot of, especially in Japan, that one became rather popular. And some of the people who, the DJs who did that were the same people doing the composition for like Streets of Rage and, you know, other, you know, side scrolling beat em ups like that back in the day. So there's a lot of cross pollination between these different genres. And as you said, also with, you know, these side scrolling shooters like, you know, Gradius and uh, R Type and stuff like that. And those ones didn't always necessarily have the same kind of melodic progression that other more traditional music had. They had their own unique kind of compositions. And they were all different too. That's the weird thing about that type of video game is that one game's music is very different from the next. Mm -hmm. There's some really good ones though. There's uh, any of the games released for the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, if you're in Europe, by Technosoft. Mm -hmm. The composers that Technosoft uses, their their name is Technosoft, but their music was not. It was heavy metal. Like it was straight up, fast paced, double kick drum heavy metal in those oh, games. Yeah. But, but all done with like a FM synthesizer on a cartridge. So it, it, the sounds weren't heavy metal sounds, but you could pick them up and play them with guitars, bass, and drums, and it would sound like a regular heavy metal band. Yeah, or like, you know, uh, id Software taking some uh, barely con uh, barely uh, concealed Pantera riffs and making them soundtrack from Doom and such. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just maybe, or slow it down. You could take a riff that's really fast and slow it down, and all of a sudden yeah. it has a different atmosphere. Yeah, I really I, one of my favorite things that people have done is take black metal tracks and turn them into surf rock. Dude, no, no, yes. for real. I, I, like I said, I like so much music. Surf rock is one of my favorite types of music. In fact, it I don't fit in in any like subculture. <laughs> <laughs> but if I were to force myself into a subculture, it would be surf rock. Because I lived in California for a while, yeah. and I used to see surf rock bands play live all the time. And the audience there that was the only audience I could kind of relate to. But surf rock, in my opinion, is the true birth of black metal. Because if you just play those same songs through, like exactly, Japanese, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Or if they're like, there's uh, like, I don't remember. I found this on YouTube. Some random, just randomly surfing through stuff is like true cult surf metal and that's the burzums the burzums is the, the name burzums the behirits <laughs> as you know <laughs> and this is just like a california a californian hunger and it's just transylvanian hunger played a surf rock and it, it's the exact same notes exact same thing just played slightly differently and it works perfectly it's, it's just unbelievable how well it, it translates a lot of those early, the, the early 60s, before like the, the late 60s came in and everything became Woodstocky, but like the early 60s instrumental rock music, I hear a lot of heavy metal in there. And the, the mm -hmm. instrumental stuff where they would have a sax player, the way that those sax players were recorded and performed, like their uh, melodies and their wails are like heavy metal screams to my ears. I yeah. love a lot of that early uh, 60s instrumental stuff and the surf rock that was part of that as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like the progression. You have you know, like the blues, uh, blues and, you know, rockabilly and stuff like that that goes into that. And as you said, you know, surf rock and those, those things. And that is the direction from which heavy metal, you know, comes. You add in like, you know, more operatic kind of feel to it, you know, jack up uh, the amplification and, you know, put some anger in behind those uh, chords. And all of a sudden you got some metal. Yeah, there was nobody playing guitars fast like that before surf rock. Those were the first guys to be playing those those quick notes and stuff. And yeah, um, 
even like a rockabilly style, you know, ding, 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 if you listen to some really heavy surf rock from the 60s, there's a there's a, an inherent danger to that music. And their idea was like you're in a pipeline, like you could drown or you could fall or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and then at the same time, they were they were like a sort of counterculture because if, if you lived on a beach, if you were a beach bum, so to speak, um, if you were like a Keanu Reeves from Point Break, like that kind of guy, like that's a heavy yeah. metal kind of guy, you know? So I think that the, 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 the mentality of a lot of those guys, not to mention that a lot of them were like World War II vets. They came back and that's, there's a biker connection with all that oh, as yeah. well, you know? So all of that kind of just blended together. And um, I really think that's where like heavy metal was born was in the early sixties. Yeah. There was definitely that, proto metal kind of you know atmosphere that you know then Corolla starts going through the 60s and into the 70s and then you get you know bands like black sabbath and stuff like that that really come in you get led zeppelin before that a little bit and adding some inspiration you know the harder rock and stuff like that they threw in some of the fantasy elements too i mean they did you know songs on lord of the rings and such and then you get you know black sabbath which is arguably one of the fir the first uh, true heavy metal band i think depending on who you ask but then from there it just explodes into its own thing yeah yeah i'm uh I, I would say i'm not the biggest black sabbath fan to be quite honest with you mm -hmm. i have no disrespect for them or anything um but uh i i got into a lot of this music when the internet was around so going back like looking at it completely objectively and all the other stuff that was happening in the early 70s yeah there's a lot of bands that were like way heavier than black sabbath and were mm -hmm. like writing music like deliberately about satanism and stuff like coven the band coven the whole second half second side of their album is a satanic uh ceremony like they literally recorded a satanic ceremony so yeah it's hard for me to like, like black sabbath um as much as i would if i didn't know anything else like if i grew up with black sabbath they'd probably be my favorite band mm -hmm. but objectively they're good and they had a great record label behind them and they had a lot of uh, people promoting them and, and getting their music out there. A lot of the bands that didn't have that same opportunity, I think had maybe a little bit more heart and yeah. uh, weren't like uh, closet Christians because all the guys in Black Sabbath are the Christians. So it's it also kind of weird to me, like they're Christians in real life, but then they're kind of pretending to be dark, even though they're really not, you know, it's just- Well, like, you listen to War Pigs and it's basically all like, yeah, yeah, Satan laughing flaps his wings. It's basically, yeah, the people who do bad things get punished in that story. So it's very much, you know, not too, uh, it's not an evil song, so to speak. Yeah. It's, not, it's a favorite, damn good sound. It's a good sounding one, but it's not nearly as evil as it sounds. <laughs> and I, I like those first few Black Sabbath albums. Mm, me too. Uh, I do. I enjoy them. My favorite Black Sabbath song is Changes, which is like the least Black Sabbath song out of all of them because it's just so different. And I think Ozzy, who's a terrible singer. I mean, I, I think most people can agree, does not have a good voice. He actually sounds sincere and heartfelt, and I really like his voice on that song. It's a very tender song. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably my my favorite Black Sabbath song is the least of all the Black Sabbaths, I guess. Uh, I mean, if of the metal that you do listen to, because it's my understanding you don't listen to all that much of it, you're more like a recent uh, uh, convert to the uh, religion of metal. But you know, are there any particular bands that you know you mentioned Man of War, obviously, you're not too much in the Black Sabbath. Are there any bands that you know currently out now that uh, interest you? There's um I still listen to metal a lot. It's just mm. that a lot of the bands that have been coming out now, they're just they're too retro for me. Mm. So I like metal. I got into metal in the late 90s, way past its heyday. But I liked it because it was very progressive music. Like there was it, it was pushing the edge, going further and further and further. For some reason, like in the last, I don't know, five, six, seven, or eight years, all these bands just want to sound like some other band from the 80s. Mm. So I don't like a lot of newer bands, except, um, not the band except, band except is good. I like the second singer better. I saw them in Salt Lake City. Oh, the Italian guy, I forget his name. He's better than Udo, the little short Italian guy. He kicks butt. Well, German. Yes. <laughs> no, I think he's Italian, though. No, I think and he... Udo Drachschneider. No, no, the guy that replaced Udo. Okay, yeah, I know. Well, I don't know about that guy, but I do know Udo's German. Yeah, <laughs> my mother would not Udo, never forgive me if I didn't mention that. <laughs> Udo was as German as you can get. You know, he's yeah. as German as German as German. But um, anyways, uh, a recent band that just came out that I cannot stop listening to, Triumpher. Now I, Triumpher. I I cringe, I, I cringe when I say the name Triumpher because 
English is not their first language and one who triumphs is not known as a triumpher typically, mm -hmm. but their, their music is so good. They really take that true metal sound of like the early 2000s to another level. Um, triumpher. They're from Greece. Yeah, you, most of my uh, favorite bands are probably along the lines of bands that were inspired by Manowar, quite honestly. And they are certainly inspired by Manowar, but they, they're much more talented musicians than Manowar. Mm. Um, the singer sounds as good as Eric Adams has sounded in the past. There's a lot of variety. They write songs that are just driving, um, very battle-oriented songs. Then there's also songs that are much more like a black metal song. Is yeah, that looking at their uh, the, one of their albums here, uh, Storming the Walls, we got uh, tracks mm -hmm. called The Thunderer, Storming the Walls, Mediterranean Wrath, I Wake <laughs> the Dragon, Esoteric Church of Dagon, good reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The Tomb, Blazing Circle. Yeah, I can see what you mean, what you mean by these guys. Yeah, I like them quite a bit. As far as newer bands, that's probably my favorite uh, newer band. Um, for the longest time, my favorite heavy metal band was Valdemar. Valdemar. Not sure. Valdemar, they're from Spain. Um, and uh, they're still putting out stuff, uh, but their last couple albums didn't really tickle my fancy quite as much. They added a keyboard player, and some bands mm. do that well, or a band that shouldn't have added a keyboard player. No, no, no. Um, but uh, yeah, their their first like four albums are really really good. They're like a cross between I would say like Manowar and Gamma Ray, where the singer almost sounds like Kai Hansen at times, but their song content is much more like Manowar, where they, they write songs about heavy metal. Like I like metal. Metal is the only kind of music that writes songs about itself. Like there's like <laughs> you know there's no I know ska what you mean. Yeah, band. yeah. There's no ska band with songs about ska or whatever else you know um but metal they write songs about heavy metal and i like bands that do that i like that true metal sound yeah well you know i well there are quite a number of you know rocks uh rock bands that do the same for uh, you know rock and roll and stuff like that but yeah metal definitely has a bit of a self-referential uh, streak to it and like yeah we're doing metal it's awesome it's like <laughs> very much like an exuberance for the genre for the genre it's playing in yeah, yeah. I think that meant a lot in the 90s. I think that's where they, that's kind of rooted, you know, when when the world turned its back on metal, uh, yeah. you know. So I think that's where that fire got kindled initially. Um, well, I think I like metal the, is very sincere in its own in its own way. It's not a it's not a really an ironic genre in many ways. It, it takes itself seriously. I think that's one of the reasons possibly sword and sorcery works so well for it uh, as well. The best sword and sorcery takes itself seriously, you know. At least, you know, to my mind. Yeah, I agree totally. And I think um, metal is unique in that it's a very, um, very earthly music. Yeah. But it has a supernatural substance as well, like sword and sorcery as well. You know, you it's sword and sorcery, you know, two things, the, the, the tangible and the intangible. Metal kind of captures that. You know, it's guys mm -hmm. that um, it, it, if you've judged them by their music, you wouldn't want to meet them in an alley somewhere. You know, but at the same time, it's it's like um, they they capture the, the the potential failures of life and the softness of existence at the same time. Yeah, guys, they can sing high notes and low notes. Um, there's a suppleness to metal that is almost that maybe brings that supernatural stuff into the context a yeah. little bit, which explains why there's so many just subgenres of it. You know, going from black metal, you know, new wave British met British metal, speed metal what you name it there's been you know a band that has done some kind of variation on it that's entirely their own like you know yeah i'm a big fan of like doom metal like kind of that albums you know um electric wizard being a particular favorite and it's just like you know that one it took everything that black sabbath was singing about and actually started really you know, pouring it on and just like really going to the occult and drug references and just like really laying that stuff out and you know the old horror movie references which brings me to another story in here a certain uh, tale of demonic horror a guy by the name of vade what can you tell me about the inspiration for this guy so uh vade is an album it's a double album i released of all uh horror music so i had a buddy of mine that um was always trying to make horror movies and i grew up outside of pittsburgh pennsylvania and i put a flyer on this video store wall saying I'm an electronic musician. If you're making horror movies, here's my number. Give me a call. I'd like to score your movies. Mm -hmm. So this buddy of mine 
hit me up and he was trying to make movies. He never quite got around to it, but I would uh, compose music for potential movies he would make. <laughs> and and uh, I just ended up with like tons of these tracks that just never went anywhere. And I really got to liken it. So um, I came up with the album Vade and I was composing it and titling this, the, the songs in such a way that it kind of told a story without intentionally meaning to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I took meaning from all that, all the little pieces of the songs, the different titles they have and what's going on. And that's kind of where the there's three stories based on Vade in yeah. the book. Specifically, um, the, the, we've got that first story I mentioned previously, A Kiss Before You Die, and the story Vade itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the character of Vade is uh, he's a he's a demon, um, and uh, there's uh, some tie-ins to uh, European horror in that primary Vade story. Um, uh, the movie Knights of Terror. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you remember Knights of Terror. It's not that one. A Spanish zombie movie. <laughs> But uh, Vade, when he's in his human form, resembles uh, the, the Peter Barker character from that film. I took a lot of inspiration from that and uh, kind of crafted a character that's sort of based on Peter Barker from that film. But when he becomes, when Vade comes forth from him, he's a totally unique uh, figure. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's, that's kind of just what it is. I would say that the horror stuff, the thing with horror is, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I, I think if you put too much, uh, meaning into horror, it, it loses its effectiveness. Like, I think you can put meaning into other genres of stuff, uh, whereas the the horror stories in that book, they're much more just atmospheric and much more uh, somewhat poetic mm. and uh, more or less stuff that you could see if it was a film. It would translate to film, I think. Yeah, like in the previous uh, story, Promontory, well, I mentioned when, you know, pulping zombies. In this case, they slurry of it just you know of all these undead corpses being reduced to sm to paste starts coalescing into a giant blob monster made of decayed flesh that starts consuming everything in its path which is definitely not something i've ever seen in a zombie flick that's for damn sure yeah thanks that's um the idea behind promontory is like a promontory is a, a cliff edge yeah. against the ocean so it's it's the rigid it's the strong it's the stone against the rising tide the waves of the tide crashing against it and the so, tide it is a rising oh boy it, yeah it's a tie of death so like the, the idea is that it, in zombie movies when something dies it comes back maybe as the same figure it was but my interpretation is all of death you know things that are in the ground dead organic matter comes to life as well and it just forms this blob that consumes and digests the any, everything around it um that's kind of the idea behind that it. it's a very it's a story about individuality as well mm -hmm. um you know it's it's one man he has a partner in this case but i essentially at the end it's one guy and it's him against the the existence of death uh, the promontory against the crashing tide of blood and gore and death and uh surviving at the end yeah yeah so well, it's, yeah that's you know definitely what i got from that one and yeah there's definitely the implication that this kind of sh stuff has happened previously somewhere else, maybe, or like certain characters have had, uh, you know, past encounters and maybe will have further encounters in the future. Any thoughts of, uh, was there any thoughts of doing any other stories, uh, continuations from the ones that are in this book? The, the promontory will have a sequel in the next book. So, mm -hmm. um, promontory, like that whole sequence of events, I imagine, like I said, repeated in my brain over and over again. And um, at the end, as I imagined the story when I was younger, um, they discover a, a space, or he, the main character discovers a spacecraft underground. So this whole idea of a time with, with this big flood of death, it's almost like the, um, the biblical delusions that we have in ancient civilizations. Every ancient civilization tells a story of that. Like every 15,000 years is a major flood that resets the earth. So that's, in my interpretation, of what that reset is, is this flood of death that comes forth. Um, and in ancient culture, uh, from the outer realms, from the cosmic space, um, has a craft underground. So he ends up going underground, he gets into the craft, and then it becomes a space battle. So the second half of Promontory, as I imagined it when I was like 22 years old, which I will continue at 40, I'm almost 50 now, <laughs> but I'll continue to tell it, is it's basically the second half is going to be a story of, of space fights, like those 2D shooters that I mentioned. Who typically end up with boss fab monsters that look like big masses of you know meat and gore. So yeah, yeah I think yeah, some of the inspiration came from those uh, for that particular concept, and I can see it working. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, there's an intergalactic council. Like in the 90s or early eight, late 80s, there was like this term that people were throwing around that were into like the supernatural. An intergalactic council that judges earthlings if they're, if they're worthy enough to join it. Mm. And it's almost like the United Nations of the cosmos, you know? So the intergalactic council gets pissed off that um, the main character did what he did and they trans tra transferred a weapon from one person to another. So they send an armada to Earth to eliminate it and just try something different. And of course he fights back and that's kind of what the second story is going to be about. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's one of those things like, you know, uh, there's occasionally you get somebody wondering, okay, why haven't we run into anybody out there? And the, one of the answer, potential answers is maybe they just don't want to talk to us. <laughs> They may have tried to talk to us in the 1940s and they realized, you know, we're just a bunch of idiots and they chose not to. And I can't say I blame them necessarily. Yeah. Or it's, you know, the old, uh, old adage that they're just so different that we literally cannot understand each other and don't even realize we're even there. Maybe uh, you are one of them. I don't know. I, I never talked to you on camera before. Can you prove that you're human? Um. Kanama Kalajarama for all the uh, cult fans out there. <laughs> okay. uh, at least they know I'm not a snake man. That's at least that. <laughs> if you're a snake man, you better watch out for one of Holly Bentley's characters. Oh, yeah. Not to the snake man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they end up getting chopped up pretty big, uh, rather uh, fondly in that story. That's for sure. Uh, there are also a whole bunch of snakes and other near dwells in another story. In this one, the uh, vi uh, the what's the name of it uh yeah i had it right here right damn it here it is vigilante romance which i think i remember from you know, having shown it off this page previously in this interview god i needed coffee but yeah this one i liked quite a bit it felt a bit like you know what if clint eastwood's character from uh Grant Torino decided to be the Punisher and dress like the Shadow. <laughs> I, I can mean, see that. Yeah. As I've mean, gotten older, I've um, I, there's just not as many movies made about older guys that still have some vitality left in them. So it's kind of like it is a geriatric guy, geriatric guy that um, finally decides to right the wrongs of his past and um, kind of uh, heal the city. He grew up in a city that has become derelict and crime ridden and it's corrupt from the top to the bottom and he knows he's going out eventually so he wants to go out trying to do something to uh, redeem himself mm. um, so it's a violent movie but he's also redeeming himself um, because of the loss of his wife so there's a there's also a soft side to that that's where the romance comes in it's a vigilante story but it's also a romantic story uh, between a man and a woman and uh fixing what he did wrong yeah. in the past. Well, it also helps that the guy has a previous military background because otherwise, you know, one thing that's always kind of, you look at something like Death Wish or, you know, those go, the Charles Bronson uh, movies, and it's like, okay, where the, by the, by the third movie, he's like a one-man, you know, wrecking crew, <laughs> and you're like wondering, how many scumbags did he shoot in between movies to get this good? I mean, like, uh, you go from the first movie, which is way more grounded, to the third one, where he's literally got a belt-fed machine gun at one point. And it's like, okay, things have escalated. <laughs> yeah, he basically becomes Rambo by the third one. Is the third one where he's fighting, like, the gangs with, like, the Mohawks, like, the punk rock yeah, gang? Yeah, where the, you know, the cops say, you're setting me loose? I'm setting you loose, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love Charles Bronson. He's a huge in, inspiration to me, but I really only like that first Death Wish movie because it's a it's a sincere. Mm. It's like the first Rocky movie, you know, it just came out of nowhere and it's yeah. got a real human element to it. Yeah, um, well, the same for the first Rambo movie as well. Yeah, First Blood is, is the best of the Rambo movies. I mean, the last one was pretty good, though. I got to say, did you see the, the finale? Uh, Rambo? The last Blood? Uh, no, I haven't seen that one yet. It's It's better than you would think. I would say, I mean, it, I didn't expect anything going into it, but it's got some heart to it as well. And it's got a great, a great ending as well. It's worth seeing, you know. It's, yeah. I'll have to yeah, put it on it. the uh, list of movies I got to catch up on. 
Yeah. But yeah, those movies definitely have their own, also their own progression. You can kind of see the tenor of the times through the eight, through the set, late seventies into the eighties into the modern day. You know, as you see, a who he's fought, Rambo's fighting, and also why he's fighting, and the kind of tone of the movies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like you go into something like the First Blood, which is Viet troubled Vietnam vet goes on a rampage after being mistreated by local police, and turns out to be a Green Beret badass that can't be stopped and it ends on him having a tear-filled you know diatribe against raging against the you know system that has let him down before finally turning himself in <laughs> yeah i mean the original story ends with him getting shot by colonel troutman but you know definitely this i think this ending is probably a lot better in this case although I remember that bit in the forest where it's like it's a slasher movie, but Rambo's, you know, Jason Voorhees. It's like, wow, okay. And he doesn't actually kill anybody during the entire first movie. I think the first movie is um it's again, that's it's a great movie about individuality, though. It's like one guy against the oppressive state that just didn't understand him. You know, they could have just let him go. He was just passing through. Mm. That's all they had to do, was just pass him through. They didn't have to give him a meal or anything, but um they had to harass them, and it's their own. They got what they deserved, quite honestly. Um, they drew first blood. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at a lot of movies from that time period, that post-Vietnam kind of, you know, before the Reagan era, kind of that particular era of Hollywood action movie, and you get, you know, often movies that are just as much drama as action. In fact, often more so. You look, uh, you know, what was the one, the Vietnam veteran who loses a hand to a garbage disposal, goes on a rampage afterwards? Uh, it's got a, to- a very young Tommy Lee Jones. I don't think I've seen that. I don't know what that is. Uh, Rolling Thunder. That's the name of that movie. I haven't seen Rolling Thunder. A guy comes been- back, is brought back from Vietnam after being a POW for oh. years. And he's like, he's having some problems adjusting, you know, and dealing with the fact that his wife remarried and, you know, all this stuff. And then some thugs decide to get bad and, well, his hand ends up in a garbage disposal. He ends up with a <laughs> fake one. It's, uh, people he care about are killed. So he just you know, has had enough at a certain point, just like you know, our character in uh, the individual any romance. Calls up one of his buddies from the army. It's James. Well, it's Tommy Lee Jones, a baby Tommy Lee Jones, and just like, yeah, I found the guys. And he's like, I'll get my gear, and he's just like, without any hesitation, puts out uh, you know a, a duffel bag, breaks out a shotgun, and just like the other guy sharpens his you know uh, army issue hook hand into f- sharpens it up, and they just go to town by the end of the mo- end of the movie. It's a, it's like not. It's like Taxi Driver almost, but less, uh, well, no, just about as much mental illness, but it's a bit more justified almost in the mm-hmm. sense like Travis Bickle is just like a complete psycho, but, you know, somehow manages to kind of get away with it in the end. It was an odd time for movies. <laughs> yeah, the 70s was, was, was weird. You could have a deranged person with heart, you know, and you can feel compassion towards them. Um, like that first Walking Tall movie. Have you seen any of the Walking Tall movies? Uh, no, not of those ones. The, the Walking Tall... Uh, I mean, the guy, Buford Pusser, is the name of the character. It's based on a true story. Um, it's a guy that came back to his hometown, and uh, he found out that his hometown was ruined. It was turned into, like, a gambling town with a whorehouse and all this stuff. And he just it just burned him up. His wife ends up getting killed, and he just goes... He kind of snaps and mm-hmm. becomes, like, this psycho Puritan like they just won't let anybody in the town have fun. Like anyone that's having any kind of fun. And he has a pusser stick, which is basically like a two by four almost. And he just goes in and just beats all these people up. And if you did that today, you'd be a psychopath. But it's portrayed in this weird 70s way where it's just like you kind of feel for the guy, you understand what he's going through. It's that post-Vietnam mm-hmm. sensation, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you have other movies like Straw Dogs has a similar kind of vibe to it and like the original, not the remake. Obviously, I don't. I haven't actually seen that remake. I don't have any idea if it uh, actually matches the tone, but I haven't heard anything good about it. I think there's a lot of that. You mentioned like you know new metal, like kind of like new metal bands looking mostly to the past and emulating uh, previous uh, bands. 
I think there's a lot of that also in, you know, you see a lot of throwback movies and, you know, throwback, you know, genres and stuff like that. I wonder you know, what the particular, if you think there's a particular reason for why people would go back. I mean, people go back to Sword and Sorcerer, which is a genre from the 1930s, obviously, mm-hmm. although there has been continuation throughout the years, obviously, but it, it had its heyday really back in the, well, from the 30s to the 60s about, I would say. And now you're seeing a resurgence of that. Do you what do you expect, really think that could be the cause of marketing? A hundred percent. It's like mm-hmm. in the '80s, there was all this 1950s stuff going on. You got your Back to the Future. You got this like weird like rockabilly stuff that was incorporated into a lot of movies in the '80s. And the, mm-hmm. the music. There's a lot of bands and pop bands that had like swing dancing and stuff and happened in the '80s. All this 1950s stuff was a resurgence in the '80s. Because people that were kids in the 50s were now adults in the 80s. So they could basically smell them the same crap twice. And that's what we're seeing now. Like the 80s and early 90s stuff is really popular now. Because people that were young then all have children and they just want to, they want to push. That's what sells. And that's what it comes down to. And I'm just not a fan of that, man. There's a lot of stuff coming out now. Like um, any movie that Eggers comes out with, like The Northman was great. Um, The Lighthouse was great. Like that's like Northman was one of my favorite movies I've seen in a long time. Yeah, I mean that. I he's coming out with Nosferatu, which is a as a reboot, but he'll do a reboot in a way that doesn't feel like a reboot, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I I follow anything that guy does. Um, a favorite director of mine, Quentin Depew, he's a French director. Mm-hmm. Um, everything he comes out with is weird and absurd and is cutting edge, and um, I eat up anything he does too. It's just the, I think like the the horror and the action movies now are just. They're just too rooted in the eighties for me. You know, I'm not a retro guy. Like I, I'm not even a fan of the eighties. I grew up in the eighties and I'm, I'm just not, I'm a, I, maybe because I saw stuff on reruns, the seventies mean a lot more to me. That was makes sense. Yeah. 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 Cause you know, I was born in the eighties. So really my childhood takes me to the early nineties, more like that. So I can see how a lot of the, my references also come from there too, but also like, you know, 80s stuff that, you know, percolated in through there. Cause let's face it, the early parts of any decade is just the previous decade with the new coat of paint to a certain extent anyway. Well, the, the things that I like from the eighties were very futuristic. There's a great sense of futurism. So there's all this new technology coming out, microchips and video games and, you know, early computer graphics, all that stuff was really mm. cool. Even like the new wave bands of the 80s always had a futuristic edge. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't know why somebody now wants to fake, like copy something that was futuristic 30, 40 years ago. Like I don't, to me, that's counterproductive. Like yeah. do something futuristic now, like start your new future. You can't copy something that was futuristic because you just, it, you're regurgitating it. Yeah. I mean, you look at you know images of sci-fi stuff from the 1980s, cyberpunk, uh, you know, that particular genre or you look at like i have a big rpg collection i have like you know you look at uh copies of like the um i have a copy of the mech warrior rpg from uh, back then from fasa and it is so 80s the haircuts mm-hmm. and you know i remember looking there's a a page in the old cyberpunk 2020 rpg one of the illustrations is with this you know yeah badass guy you know punk haircut big gun and a cassette tape <laughs> like an old VHS or Betamax cassette tape, like your know, confidential top secret information on the list. Like we you had know. Transformers that were Walkmans. I mean, was Shockwave would transform into a little Walkman? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, there's a whole you know, like a whole branch now of like aesthetic branch that called cassette futurism, which is like a future as the '80s would have you know imagined it. You look at you video games like for instance like yeah alien isolation which is obviously since it's based on a film from that era but that kind of retro futuristic and that the aesthetic it's still the future there's still advanced technologies that we don't have and you know advanced computer systems but they're designed in such a way as to be as the 80s assumed they were going to look like and you have that kind of very analog feel to it which has a especially in case of movies or video games has a feel all of its own that I think is still kind of very appealing. Yeah. I, I'm a really appealed. I'm really appealed. I find that tangible things, very appealing. So mm. uh, I can understand why people like vinyl has had a, a comeback and why people mm. like cassettes. 
I'd never want to listen to music on a cassette because it's a crappy format for listening to music. But I get the idea. Like, I like the idea of opening something up and seeing the lyrics and looking at it mm. and holding something in your hand. Like people that, young people that don't know anything except for streaming or if they're lucky, know about MP3s and maybe were around when that came out. Um, they kind of want something. They, they, I think they have an uh, interest. Yeah. As someone who has had to pull a cassette out of his car's tape deck and have all the string coming out and like, oh, crap, crap, crap. I don't want to go back to that. But there is something to be said about physical media in the sense that I'm not going to lose my entire music collection if the power goes out. Yeah, totally. I've got a a huge vinyl collection. I've got thousands of CDs as well. Um, I, I love that stuff. And and I do think that we could come to a time where we do lose everything that's streaming. Mm-hmm. Like I, it's not, it's not inconceivable that everybody's Spotify app just disappears off their phone one day yeah. or whatever they've got on a cloud somewhere is just erased. It could be a terrorist attack. It could be a mistake. It could just be Maybe a company going bust. Seriously. Cause they don't own that. It's the companies that, that own all that. So you, you're borrowing that music when you stream it. You're yeah. not actually playing something you own. Yeah. The only people who own digital music are the pirates. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like uh, going uh, back a little bit uh, years ago back, um, Google Plus was a thing and various, you know, RPG subgroups and like, like the OSR and stuff like that really got into that and used it a lot to, you know, organize, create blogs and to create like little communities of different ideas. And that entire social media is gone now because it didn't make enough money for, you know, Alphabet and Google. So all that stuff, if it wasn't archived somewhere else, erased. All those discussions, all those ideas. There's was a major diaspora to various other places, but you know it's never been the same since, of course, because you know you no longer had that cross pollination between different groups because they weren't all in the same place. Yeah, yeah, I can see that happening. With, I mean, in many ways, it might even be a blessing if that were to happen with a lot of the social media things we have now. I, I wouldn't mind a reset in in some ways with that stuff. Mm. Um, that's my one of my weaknesses, man. I'm I'm a guy that tries to be better and better at, at different things. I'm a complete loser when it comes to social media because I I cannot like I'm looking at we're talking on my phone right now, and I have in the back of my brain. Let's check your Facebook Messenger. <laughs> let's see if anyone has liked something put on on YouTube. And I hate that. I hate that I'm connected yeah. to this. Thing. On the other hand, your phone is really really good. Your camera. I think the camera on your phone is better than the one I've got. <laughs> Dude, you know this um, this phone is like three years old now, but it's been good. I have um, my, I have a regular desktop computer that I do for I use for video editing and music mm-hmm. and stuff like that. That's in the other room, and that's where my dog's at. So that's why I'm here because he'll be just going crazy. Yeah. But um, I have a laptop that I tried to use for other things with uh, Zoom, and it just sucks. Something about this phone works better than my laptop. So unbelievable. I mean, yeah, that's the whole thing about technology. But, you know, you uh, being an electronic uh, artist who worked in electronic music, I mean, technology is pretty much, you know, keeping up with it and knowing how to use it is pretty important for that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I like technology. I am. A, I, I don't want to live in any other era than this current era, despite mm-hmm. all the problems we have and the perceived malignancy of our culture. This is still the best time to be alive. And I I like uh futurism so much that i'm a, I'm an early adopter to stuff mm-hmm. so I, I like anything digital i i'll tell you this this is a hot take i like ai art i'm probably the only person is going to tell you that i don't like what people do with ai art mm-hmm. but the technology for ai art is a godsend for an artist like for me i got shaky hands so i, I wanted to be a painter and i can't hold a brush steady mm-hmm. but i can imagine paintings and if I could give prompts to a computer and describe in great detail what I want that painting to look like, it's still my painting. Even if I didn't do it with my hands, it's the mind. All art comes from the mind, whether people want to admit it or not. Yeah. AI art can open that up. It's going to allow people that are visionaries to be artists in ways that they didn't have the capability to do so in the past. Yeah, I can see definitely some a lot of positive uses for these technologies. I think a lot of the problem with AI art is the fact that it's being trained on, you know, whatever art it can come across online. And that means a lot of people's art is getting ripped off in the process. And you can sometimes like, I've seen pictures people have come up with various prompts and you can see like half the signature on some painting from somewhere that's like there and like, okay, 
beyond the fact that nobody can get fingers to work properly right now and which reminds me of like didn't they used to like you know if you want to make sure you're not dealing with a fairy or demon on the road count their teeth count their teeth and check their fingers and they're like okay this is getting a little bit too old school <laughs> yeah but one really AI good art. yeah one really good use of ai art this guy who did uh, this t-shirt here a guy uh, by the name of mr zerono over in uh, connecticut he does uh, art like this, you know, like uh, pages from the Necronomicon and stuff like that. He's been doing some really cool stuff, make like visualizing old 80s, 70s and 80s horror movies and fantasy movies from a reality that never existed. So you get like stills of these movies and it's just like, oh man, I wish somebody had, had the budget to pull this off back then. That would have been epic. And, and I think AR, AI art can give us that opportunity. Not now. It may be five years, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. But the, the potential to create things that are feature-length length films with no cast or crew, with no you know team of people animating it, um, that, that could be really possible. Mm -hmm. I don't like that it's derivative. Like what you said about it copying stuff, that's, that's bad. Yeah. I mean, but that's just how it is now. I, I think that it'll get to a point where just as I'm speaking to you, I could be dictating like as if I had a secretary, I could dictate to a secretary to write up a memo. I could dictate to a computer to write up an image or an animated image that represents exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. I, I could see that happening and it can really change things. People are afraid that like AI is going to take over, but there is no AI without the eye. And the eye, the intelligence comes from the human brain one way yeah. or another. Well, currently we're not dealing with like... Um general artificial intelligence or sapient artificial intelligence these are still like glorified chatbots visual or you know text or otherwise and they only do what they're programmed to do really they can so some of them can be designed to alter their own code in certain ways or implement certain things but they only ever they can have no wants or needs of their own as such so if someone could ever actually manage to program that and then we'd have some serious worries probably, but at the moment you can still pull the plug and they're not going to go full Skynet on your ass. So we're not at that point quite yet. At least hope not. I think really this is one of those interesting times where we're experiencing probably what happened with the printing press uh, back in the day where you had like all these people like, you know, copyists and stuff like that who were just like, people who were, you know, bookmakers and book, uh, you know, specialists, uh, people in that industry who were really, 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 really worried about, you know, what was going to happen to them now that this technology allowed just anybody to, with even without to all the skills and the time and the effort that they put into it to do something, at least a reasonable facsimile of what they've been doing. And I think that there are a lot of the fear from actually from other artists and creators with regards to AI art is simply that, that what they spent, you know, a great deal of blood, sweat, and tears to achieve is now done with the press of a button. And I think that there is something to that, perhaps not in terms of like, you know, general ethics of it, but it must be still burn to have, you know, to see someone else say, look, I made art. And it's like, no, you didn't. I'm an artist. <laughs> what the hell? There's definitely, I think, uh, some of that too to it. And they're not entirely unjustified. No, I get where they're coming from, especially if you've done it for decades and you grew up training because the, the, the dexterity of, of using your hands to do stuff is a skill all in itself. I get yeah. it. But at the same time, I'm okay with death. Like I'm generally pro death in most cases. I don't mind if art dies. I'm an artist. I don't mind if art dies. If all music dies, it's okay. We've, we've done music. It's like the pyramids. Uh, the pyramids are probably 15, 20,000 years old. We don't know how they built them. It's lost technology. I kind of think we're sort of at that point now where like the media age, the the music, the, the photography, I'm a photographer as well. It's mm -hmm. why I can bother now. All that stuff is kind of just dying. I think like the next generation, it may, it may simply die off and that's okay. We'll move on to something else. There'll be something else that our species does that is that represents our ideals and represents our our view of existence besides music because really it's it's kind of all done you know hmm. yeah well you know it's okay it, it to let things go that's my point yeah it's like i'm okay uh with with things uh that everything's temporal if it goes it goes as long as you find something else to, to fill that void 
I think that's kind of the purpose of, of life. The kind of what makes life living for me is that to let something go, to cut ties with something, to burn a bridge with uh, an activity or with a person or whatever it is, and to kind of relish that sense of loss and despondency and then translate that into something else. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like maybe where we're at. Maybe this AI art will just kill it. I don't know. And if it kills it, it's okay. I hope I live to see it die because it'll be a great thing to witness that turning point of civilization when all art dies. Be interesting. Even if all art dies, I think there's always going to be somebody to whistle a jaunty tune or something like that that will just <laughs> pop into their head one day. I don't think we'll ever... I don't think we'll ever reach that point where we don't enjoy the sound of pleasant sounds that we make for ourselves or pleasant images that we make for ourselves, irregardless of how we end up doing them. Yeah, I think you're right. I just don't think it will ever be the focal point of someone's life. Maybe it will. I'm not saying I'm not predicting the future because I honestly don't know. But if it were to change to the point where it's just like wallpaper, we're like 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 a Frazetta painting is is relegated to wallpaper it's not very important anymore um i'm okay with that being the case i'm okay with people not devoting their life to doing something that somebody did 50 years ago hmm. well so long as they create something new in themselves yeah yeah or or, or not I, I mean not everybody has to be creative too i, I don't true. know i guess i'm weird in that way like i i just in general i don't mind when things die I guess that's what I'm getting at. Like death, <laughs> like, uh, I mean, I don't want anything to die, but if it dies, it dies. It's like Drago. If he dies, he dies. Okay. If he dies, he dies. I, I'm, I'm kind of like Drago in that way. You know? uh, well, on the subject of death and the ending of all things, Mr. John Zaremba, author, musician, excellent conversationalist, I might say. Thank you, Bastian. I, I appreciate it. Now, would I say your name Bastion? Bastion? How would you like? How would the, the proper pronounce? Because you're French Canadian, right? Dernière fois que j'ai vérifié, ouais. It's Bastion. Technically, Bastion. it should be. It probably would be Bastian if uh, my uh, mother had uh, decided to go with the full German pronunciation. But you know, go for something a little bit more local. So long as it's not Bastion. like. So long as it's not Sebastian or Damien. Someone's actually called me Dam Damien one time, and I like. Where the hell did you get that from? I mean, I'm flattered. I think I should probably have more Latin chanting in the background whenever I go somewhere. But, you know, it's not my name. <laughs> well, Bastion is a great name. So I appreciate you having me on. Man. It's been a great conversation. Oh, it's no more problem. The book is... Would you like to say the title of the book? <laughs> Type in John Zaremba. It's, it's, the book is called <laughs> XLVABK001. I don't want you to remember it. If anything, just remember... This guy that has an annoying book title that went on and on for however long we've been talking, just type <laughs> in his name and the book will come up. Check it out. Buy it. It'd be great if you like it. If you don't like it, if you don't want to buy it, that's cool too. But um, check it out. You, uh, Amazon is where you go. So just type in Zaremba and Amazon. Yes. And it'll probably be one of the first things that comes up. Yes. You can check out his book on Amazon. His uh, music is uh, available on Bandcamp. If you want to check it out, there link will be in this link for both will be in the description. And this has been Zero Sum, aka Bastion, not Damien, speaking to Mr. John Zaremba. I would like to thank you all for watching. Thank you, John, for coming on, and wish everybody an excellent rest of their day. Thanks, guys.